Hello and welcome to Really Cool People, a podcast produced by Schweitzer Church. I'm your host, Jason Leininger. This is a place to hear stories of really cool people. And it's our hope in that in hearing these stories, each of us will be inspired, encouraged, and challenged through moments of serendipity. In a sermon entitled The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis said, There are no ordinary people. You and I have never talked to a mere mortal. Well, today it's my joy to introduce you to somebody who is really cool. Today we're going to hear from Miss Lynette Lewis. She is indeed no ordinary person. Lynette is going to introduce us to growing up in Trinidad and Tobago, and then she's going to talk about uh, many movements in her life, moving from there to England and then coming to America. She has the perspective and life of an immigrant. She has much joy, and she has much hope and much faith. For throughout her story, she's going to share with us a couple of statements. And one of those is, I believe God is with us. I believe God is working. So today, it's my joy to introduce you to Lynette Lewis. And Lynette is just going to take the microphone and talk for a while. So sit back, listen, enjoy her story, and see, see this really cool person among us. Well, today, we are glad to welcome to the Really Cool People podcast, Lynette Lewis, or somebody that I often refer to as Miss Lynette. Yes, you do, Reverend Jason. <laughs> Let's start with your story. I consider my story interesting, mainly because people here always tell me it's interesting when I give them some inf- little information about me. First thing is I was not born in America. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, the two last islands in the chain of West Indian islands off the coast of Venezuela. I've never been to Venezuela, but my husband has, and he was born here in Springfield. That's another story. But I lived and went to school and had a wonderful time in the Caribbean until I was about 14. And then my mother moved the family to England. That was a time where things were, there were big changes in the, especially the British Caribbean, because we were getting our fighting for our independence from England. And some people like my mom worried about what would happen. My father was quite happy because He was moving up in the political scheme of things, but she was worried about what would happen when the Trinidadian politicians took over the government. So she took herself and the children to London. It was an interesting trip. It was by ship. It was not your modern cruise cruise ships, because this was back in 1956 when I was 14 years old. I was going, I had finished my, what they called there, the exhibition exams. So I was in the high school where you go for college prep. And I was happy with my life. I was happy with my friends going swimming after school on a bike. And (laughs) I had a wonderful life, I thought, and we packed up and moved on a ship that I did not particularly like the ship. It was packed. It was, and we traveled on I, the lower class. I, it definitely wasn't close, first class. We were really crowded in. And it was interesting. I managed to see how the upper class on the ship <laughs> lived because they had a competition. The ship was called, it was Italian, and it was called the SS Napoli, meaning Naples. And that's when I learned how varied life can be in different cultures. That was my first smack up against that. Not, no longer British, but Italian. Everything on the ship was Italian, the food and everything else. And they had their elected, I guess you call it, or something. 
they had a Miss Napoli competition. I remember my mother <laughs> setting up some kind of lamp. She was very clever, very inventive. She was a seamstress and could do anything. And she pressed my hair. I don't know if you know what pressing your hair is. You should. She had brought her hot combs and she used that lantern thing to straighten my hair so I could be in the competition. Well, she straightened it and then she curled it and made curls in it. I was 14 and a half at the time. Everyone else in the competition was an adult. <laughs> I was the youngest person. But my mother dressed me up and fixed up my hair, and she even put makeup on me, which I had never worn and which I still do not wear. <laughs> I didn't like it. And I was Miss Napoli. The older girls were very upset with me <laughs> because they knew how young I was <laughs> when I won that. But I got to sit at the captain's table for dinner every night after that. That's how I saw, first saw, how the other half lived. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> but the trip was, it was a 30-day trip across the Atlantic. Picture the Caribbean, Southern Caribbean. And we crossed the Atlantic and went up to the Mediterranean. We entered the Mediter Mediterranean and we landed in Genoa, Italy. And from there we took a train. And as you can imagine, the trains were not that fancy as they are now. Remember 1956 train, and it wasn't the plush trains that the wealthy traveled on. But we were on the train, a family together, several families. And we traveled across Europe from Italy to Paris, we got off at the coast of France. There was no channel then <laughs> for us to go through. So we were on a ferry, a ferry boat we went over on to get to England. That was not a smooth crossing either. <laughs> Fortunately, I never got seasick. So I managed it well. I like looking out. I got to see the White Cliffs of Dover. I had read about them. And I got to see the White Cliffs of Dover as we landed. We landed. There were people there to meet the colonials coming in. We were coming from the colonies to settle in the mother country. <laughs> And we were guided to a, my mother had made arrangements somehow for us to rent a house in London, in a suburb of London. And that's where we went. I went to school in England for the rest of my basic education, elementary education. I didn't know it was special to go to a grammar school because of kind of school I'd been to in Trinidad, I was put into a grammar school. Although they tried to put me in a lower grade, and when I went home and told my mother I was learning the same stuff I had learned in Trinidad, my mother, who was only educated to the age of 15, went back, went to school with me the next day and straightened them out. And my brother had the same experience. They put us up a form. We did not have grades. I never went to school with grades. I never went to a co-ed school until I got to St. Louis University and boys were in the same room. But all my school years up until then were girls only. That's the way it was in Trinidad and Tobago because it was English system. And then when I got to England, I went to a grammar school for girls. It was interesting. I was the first, and at the time, the time period, only black child in the school because the colonials had only just started escaping their countries, which were becoming independent. And that was an interesting experience. 
children asking me. Now, I was taking Latin. I was moved up a grade, but they always asked me, did you live in a house or did you live in a hut? Did you live in a tree? And, and they were seriously, and they, one would ask me and another one would come and ask me. They'd go back and talk to each other and then come back again. So being me, and now Reverend Jason may come to understand why I am me and how I became me, I stopped explaining things. I simply said yes to every question they asked, no matter how ridiculous. Did you live in a tree? Did you live <laughs> in a hut? You know, I'm sitting next to you, studying Latin alongside you, and you ask me, did I live in a tree? So I say yes. I never again corrected anything. After about a week, I stopped correcting. My brother told me he was having the same problem in school, but he got angry with the questions. He considered them insulting. I consider anger a waste of my time and energy. I try to explain that to him. They're not worth it <laughs> if they don't know. And we know so much about them. Don't get angry. Feel sad. <laughs> Be grateful. But... It was a mistake in the sense that they followed me home from school and I wasn't aware of it. They always asked, could they come home with me? And I just told them no. And we rode on buses to school, but they were not yellow buses. They were the red double-decker buses because of the distance we had to go. I did not realize they were following me. One day I after I went upstairs, after I got home to change my clothes, I heard my mother's tone in a way that let me know I was in big trouble. Minerva, that's my middle name, by the way, Lynette Minerva, come down here now. <laughs> so I went down there now, and as soon as I spotted the uniform, because we wore uniforms to school, I always wore a uniform with a tie, there's some kind of uniform with a tie and a blouse and skirt. And they still had theirs on, so I knew where they were coming from. And apparently they had told her the things that I said that we did, like live in trees and live in hunts. Of course, I didn't say it. They said it. Anyway, she was extremely angry that I would tell people that kind of thing about us when I knew it was a lie. So I explained to her when she stopped promising to do things to me, which I knew she would. She listened and I said, Mom, they kept asking me. And when I explained to them, they just sent another one to check it out because they didn't believe me. So I just said, yes. She said, oh. And I told her Steve had the same problem. I didn't get a whipping, which my mother was good at those whippings. She was a strong woman. <laughs> I didn't want one. I didn't get one, but she understood then. And she showed them around the house. And they were surprised that we had a refrigerator because in England you still put pies to cool on the window ledge. Most people, the wealthy people, the royals, had refrigerators. They were shocked to see a refrigerator in our house. And we actually had a TV, which we didn't have in Trinidad because they hadn't arrived there yet when we left. But my mother was a very modern woman <laughs> and loved to shop. Anything she saw in the shops, they could get her to buy. So we had refrigerator, TV, everything. And they were very surprised that we lived a little better than the average English person going to my school. I was always proud of my mother, but I was always scared to death <laughs> of the other side of my mother. <laughs> Life in England was interesting. That's where we first learned racism. It was a challenge. School wasn't even quite as bad as when I went into nurses' training. 
after I graduated from grammar school. I went to a nursing school, which was basically a hospital, which taught, trained, they called it. I like teaching. They taught nurses. And it was very good. I got a good nursing education there as well and was well prepared when I came to this country. I had no problem getting a job in this country. I won't go through all of that. That was fun too. I also met racism with that. When I went to get, I had to get a license to practice over here. They want, the hospital wanted to hire me and they wanted to put me in a position on a pediatric unit that required that I be licensed in this country. That was a challenge because we were in Kansas and the state board of nursing there, I had to be interviewed by the secretary of the board, which I dealt with over the phone at first because I was already working at the hospital. And it went well, and she told me they like nurses from England. They're very well trained because they had experience as a couple. So she said, but then the day before she was supposed to present me to the board because they wanted to give me the license without any exams or anything, which I was happy with. But she told me I had to come in and meet her before. I worked evenings before I went to work that day. I should stop by and we can talk before I was presented to the board the next day. When I walked in, I didn't realize the lady sitting with her back to me on the corner of a table in this room with a lot of clerks and stuff. I heard them say, Miss Benton, your appointment is here. And she jumped down off the table and turned around and took one look at me and turned back around and got back on the table and kept talking. No typing happened in that span <laughs> of time. It just got really quiet because it was very obvious she was insulting me. And after she, I just stood there, I asked the person at the desk where I was, where is her office? And she pointed to it. So I went and stood at the office door watching her. And she finally got down and came and stood at the other side of the office door and said, now I'm a registered nurse. I'm working as a graduate nurse there because I'm not licensed as a registered nurse. I had been accepted at the hospital and been working a few months and the hospital sent me to get registered so they could put me in a different, in a head nurse position on the pediatric unit. They needed one, and I was filling the slot. And she looked at me and said, have you ever considered becoming a licensed practical nurse? I did not fully know what a licensed practical nurse was at the time. We had, we called them licensed volunteer nurses. I think it was LVN in England, not LPN. But I kind of figured that's what she meant. And I just looked at her and said, no, I haven't. That's why I went to school to become a registered nurse. And the paperwork that I believe is on your desk in there, as I pointed to it, explains that. And it explains why Stormont Vale Hospital sent me here to get registered. And she said, well, they're mistaken. <laughs> I cannot refer you to the board for becoming a registered nurse. And she went back to where she'd been sitting. I was very good. I didn't hit her. I didn't throw anything. My mother would have grabbed her by the neck. I knew it. <laughs> I'm glad she wasn't there. She was back in England. <laughs> and I did not go to work. Well, I called them at work. I told them, I'm sorry, I cannot come to work. I'm a bit messed up. <laughs> What's wrong? What happened? So I told them, come here. You come here right now. You come straight to work. You don't have to go to the floor. You come to, this is the matron. Come to my office immediately. <laughs> I went down there. And she, and she had two lawyers in the office with her, and they wanted to go back with me. To the, <laughs> I'm not going back there. 
I will never stand in front of that woman again. I just cannot. I just cannot. I cannot accept that I let her speak to me in that way. And, you know, it just bugs me. Anyway, I did not go back. I did go home. And luckily, when my husband came, he was in the Air Force. And when he came home from work that day, before I could tell him what happened, he presented me with the information. We were being transferred from Forbes Air Force Base where we were and where our children had been born. I'd had two children since my arrival in the country. And we were being transferred to another base. So I let the hospital know I would not be back. Don't bother. You can stay here and we can work. <laughs> no. I will move on. And we, I, we went to New Mexico or somewhere like that. And I decided to take state boards. And I learned enough about nursing here and how it works. And I took state boards in New Mexico, but I had to fly back there to do it because in the meantime, he was transferred again <laughs> from New Mexico to California in the Mojave Desert. And I had already scheduled to take boards, so I took a flight and went back to New Mexico, took my boards and passed them well enough that I am now registered. I could automatically be registered, and anybody who's in nursing knows how the boards go. I am registered automatically in New York and California, as well as New Mexico, because New York and California required the highest passing grade to accept you for licensure. So they accepted my licensure. And I can work anywhere in this country as a registered nurse. That's how I came to work in Missouri. And my husband was like the lawyers. He wanted to, you stay here and fight. I, for some, I'm normally a fighter, but for some reason, it was such a shock to me. To un I understood racism. I, I knew racism. We had racism in Trinidad and Tobago. If you had long, slender hair, like an Indian or Chinese, it wasn't just a matter of the color. It had to do with the hair. You can get a job at a bank or somewhere. They would not hire Negroes, as they called it. So <laughs> I understood racism to a point, but I got to go to a school that had it, you had to pass this exam. I have younger sisters by my father who went to that school because of my father's position in the government, even though they were Negro. <laughs> they could go there from kindergarten Normally, Negroes couldn't go there from kindergarten, so you get to understand certain things. And to, you just accept them as you live them. When I got to England, it hit me a little harder. When you take care of patients, while you're taking care of them, they call you sunshine and how much they love you and how wonderful you are. And if they see you in the street when they get out of the hospital, you learn not to say anything unless they greeted you first. Normally, from when you're from the West Indies, you greet adults, especially especially older people. You always greet them. You just don't walk past people. And if you walk in a room, you say hello to everyone. You walk around. Africans, I notice, do this too. You walk around and greet everyone in the room. I learned not to greet people I knew in public in, from in England, which carries over to this country. <laughs> I came to this country. I married an American and came to this country after I had lived some time in England and had gotten acclimated to that, and I was already a nurse and came over here to America. The wonderful thing about coming here, I came alone. <laughs> I married an American. He came back. I stayed until I finished my nurse's training. I would not come without the ability to support myself. 
So he came back, and then I came back about a year later on my own. And that was an interesting experience, flying and arriving at St. Louis Airport at night. On my own, it seemed. There were a lot of people around me, and I always greet people and talk to people. So I talk to people on the flight and in the airports. But when I landed at night, I was kind of nervous, and my husband's family picked me up at the airport, and I was absolutely amazed. Highway 70. If you know the English streets, you know how very narrow they are. <laughs> and there's not as much light in England as there is here. And when I saw all the lights and that, how many lanes the 70 have? <laughs> A four-lane highway on one side, and I was just in awe. I kept telling myself, though, God is here, too. It was so wonderful that I'd been raised with God in my life and my heart because I kept wondering, what is going to happen to me? This place is so big. I can't be here by myself, <laughs> but I'm not. God is here with me. My husband's family picked me up was in a very nice car, and they kept talking. I was answering very few questions because I was mostly praying. <laughs> God, I thank you. I pray that you will be with me all the way here. I know you're with mom. And that seeing the sky here was another thing. I know they seeing the same sky in America because in England it was the same thing when we were in Trinidad and Tobago. It was the same sky, same God. It was so wonderful to have that reassurance because I was scared to death. And then I was taken to a little town because that's where his family was from. And they wanted me to meet the elders in the family first, although that's not where we were going to be staying that night. They took me to a little town called Kinlock. It was an all-black town. It was dark. That was the only place in America that was dark. They didn't have all the street lights and stuff I'd been seeing coming from the airport. And as we got close, I... I really began to pray because I thought, where are they taking me? All of a sudden, it's all dark. And they took me to a little shop. It was The family had a little sweet shop, and you had to go up several wooden steps to get in. And I have to tell you this experience because it was my first time that I was really that scared and yet that grateful. As I walk, we walk past through the sweet shop into this room, and everybody, this was Africa. It was America, but it was Africa. All these people sitting around the outside of this big room. And when you walk in the door, you centered on a woman. <laughs> Her name was Akira Harris, I was told. She sat both upright. She was what the age I am now. I am 81 now. I think she, they told me she was in her 90s. So I guess she looked kind of like me, only she was taller. She had her head wrapped like I used to do. And she just sat there. I had the right manners. I walked around the room greeting people, but I kept an eye on her. <laughs> And they had me skip her. I went around the room, introduced myself and greeting people. And then I got to back where I started, and I just stood there because I didn't know what to do. And her voice was behind me, and she said, Come here, child. <laughs> this is that time. And I turned around, and I walked to her, and I said, Yes, ma'am. You speak English. <laughs> I think they thought he'd married a foreigner and brought her back. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. What's your name? I told everybody my name. I told him my name. And she was very nice. She said, I'm his grandmother. 
I'm glad you're respectful. They teach you good. <laughs> I stopped being scared, and that's when I was so very grateful. I was so glad afterwards that they brought me there first. I would not have known that he had the same, the same background, essentially, that I did. Because there's nothing in America that reminds me of Africa or the Caribbean. Not in the America I live in. So I was grateful. I settled in America. We went to the base. He was at Forbes Air Force Base in Topeka, Kansas. Went to the base, proceeded to have two children. <laughs> and then, like I said, it started transferring us around. And I started working as a nurse and learning America. Learning America was very interesting. I know you see an America You see America in several different ways. If you're Caucasian, you see it one way. <laughs> if you're Black American, you see it another. Us immigrants, depending on where we come from, we see it differently. But I'll tell you something that most of us should see America as and appreciate. An example to others of how to live together. We're not doing it very well right now. But the reason people like me are grateful to become American is because what you put out into the world is loving others, welcoming others. I don't care what's going on now. I'm telling you about the America I saw as a child before I ever came here. This is the message I got. And after I got here, after I met the racism and all the other stuff, there was, there was still always more people who smiled at me than frowned, more people who greeted me, more people who accepted my greetings, more people who showed me how, more people who treated my children well in school and out. So I knew God was right when he told me, it's okay to go by yourself, girl, because my mother was telling me, you got no business. She loves America. She's the reason I love America, I think. She always wanted to come to America, and I appreciate that I got the opportunity to bring her to America for a visit. When we lived in California, so she got to visit Disney World. Disneyland, I think it's land in California. But I changed churches. I'll tell you about my religion now. Where I was born, I was baptized Anglican. I think that's the Episcopal Church here, yeah. And we were baptized in the cathedral, <laughs> believe it or not, huge cathedral. Uh, but then when I married my first husband, he was Catholic and insisted I had to become a Catholic before we could get married. To me, it's one God. I'm still going to pray the same way. I like disaffiliation. I will always pray the same way and to the same God. So it doesn't bother me, I tell myself. Anyway, <laughs> I became a Catholic. But I didn't stay Catholic for very long because it didn't take me long to discover he wasn't a real Catholic anyway. He just said that, so it's one way of control. But he was not a faithful Catholic. So I walked away from Catholicism. What was going on? Oh, a friend of mine, her daughter was talked out of having an abortion, which I think was a good thing for that child, teenager. Her family were Catholic, black Catholic, I must add. And she, when she found out she was pregnant, she was hysterical and wanted an abortion. They took, took her to talk to the priest and, oh, we're not going to allow that. And the priest consoled her and told her she would always be welcome. It's a child of God. You welcome a child of God and all this good stuff. But when she actually had the baby and the parents took her there, 
to have the baby baptized, the same priest told her, we can't baptize that baby. It was born out of wedlock. <laughs> I walked away from the Catholic Church in two steps. Too much hypocrisy. I'm sorry. If any of you are Catholic, I apologize. But that's my opinion. I couldn't get out of Catholicism fast enough. And, of course, I had to keep looking for a church because wherever I lived, wherever I moved to, wherever I went, if you know I lived there, find out where I went to church because I went to church everywhere. They always had a church that would allow me in. They let me in twice. <laughs> At the time, I was wearing head wraps and caftans everywhere. I came to Schweitzer and was welcomed. So I always go to church. I found United Methodism, and that's why I'm so hooked on it. I liked having a method. I liked being able to read stuff and find out what I was allowed to do and not allowed to do and what other people should be doing and shouldn't be doing. That's why I like Methodism. And Reverend Spencer assures me that he is also a Methodist. Yes, he did. <laughs> I love my life. I love where I was born. I love the places I've lived. I always love people. There are very few people I do not like. I do not like Eula Mae Benton, the woman who made me nervous that I would not be able to carry on my career that I had earned. Other than her, and if she showed up now, I'd probably love her too because she'd probably be able to give me a reason why she behaved the way she did. And I'd accept it because it's her reason. I like people. I look at people and believe we were all made by God. I don't care what religion, what color, what whatever they are. When I was praying here in the pantry with patients, when we first started the prayer ministry, I remember a young man who came and he had one of those, what's the flag, not the Union Jack, not the American flag, the Southern flag, the Dixie flag. I hadn't noticed when he drove up in his truck, it had a big Dixie flag on the back. But when he finished getting his groceries, they asked him as usual, would you like prayer? And I usually walk up and say, I want prayer, so I hope you like to pray with me. And he looked nervous, and he said, well, yes. And he had a little baby boy with him. I said, come on in. We went in. And I started chatting with him, and he said, I, I better stop you because <laughs> I guess you didn't notice I, I, I have, uh, what do they call the flag? Dixie flag. The Dixie flag on my car. And I'm, I'm a Southerner. And, I, I'm, I look, and then he showed me a ring he had on that was that, too. And I looked at him and I smiled and I said, are you comfortable being a Southerner? He said, yes. And my family, I said, good for you. I said, I don't care what you are. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. And that's why we don't burn the cross. We light it. I said, I don't care what you do with the cross. Please don't come on my lawn. No. And he laughed. It made him feel better when I said, I said, I just want us to pray together. I believe you're a child of God, and I played with the baby. So to me, people have the right. I knew there was a union. What is the flag? The Dixie flag was on one of the houses behind the church. And somebody asked me, had I ever seen that flag? I said, oh, yeah. I parked back here. I used to park back there then. I said, yeah. Does it upset you? I said, no. It's only if they put it in my yard. <laughs> because I pay a lot of money for my yard. I want what I want in my yard, but they have a right to have their flag. I believe that, and I think they should be comfortable with it. Election time around here. You may not notice how many cars, how many different names we're voting for as we come into this sanctuary and pray to the same God, and God wants us to be honest about our beliefs and honest about who we look to to lead us. I think so. Just like he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. I will not render unto certain Caesars in this country 
but it's got to have their head on the thing, and it don't, so I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I'm grateful that God has put me in a position financially that I'm in. I never thought we'd be in the position we're in. I was upset when my mother died in England. I was extremely upset when my son, my oldest son, died at 35 before his 36th birthday. I am a Christian. I do believe in God, but I get angry at God sometimes. When he took my son, I was extremely angry. I told him, you can take me. Don't. He hasn't finished growing. I haven't seen what you're going to make him into. Why did you do that? And look at his poor brother. His brother was younger. And since he came on this earth, Eddie was here. He followed Eddie around. Even in their 30s, he was still following Eddie and loving Eddie. And he took, God took Eddie from him. So I had a chat with God about that. I've had chats with God about a lot of things. Even some of the people I pray with here, when they tell me what they want me to pray about, the stuff that's happened, after I pray with them in a nice positive way, <laughs> have a chat with God. But why'd you let that happen to these people? Don't you love them? <laughs> Show them some more love. They need it. You know, they, they're scared. They're not dealing with it well. Show them some more love, Lord. So I believe God wants us to be honest with him, because he knows. He knows when we're mad at him, even if we don't say it. I know he knows when I'm mad. But he also knows that I depend on him even when I'm mad. I know when bad things are happening to me, God is right there with me. I believe that's the only reason I can walk on through it. Right now, I've had a lot of pain, physical pain. I was in a car accident when I first started working. I hadn't been at the VA two weeks before my spine was messed with, and I've had umpteen surgeries up and down my spine since then. I have a lot of pain. I take a lot of pain medicine. Thank you, Lord, I say often for not letting me get addicted, for keeping me straight with that because I've had a lot of opportunity to become an addict, and I've always walked away from that. Thank you, Jesus. But I know there are a lot of people who have as much troubles, as much pain as I do. I'm facing what I've come to understand is my biggest challenge now. My husband has dementia. And my future, our future, does not look as great as it did. But I believe God is walking with us. My husband is not a believer. He started out as a believer in his childhood and came to stop believing, as some people do. I think he lost his humility when he ran into some. He became aware of just how racism was affecting his life, I think is what it is. It had to do with his education. It made him very angry. So he, I believe he lost his humility more than he lost God because God is still there taking good care of him. God has been good to him. <laughs> I don't care what he says. But his dementia, he used to take care of me. In fact, I gave him a nursing license because he took such good care of me. I've had so many surgeries and stuff. And I've never had to go for after surgery, go stay in the hospital any length of time. My husband could take care of me, and he always did. He did so many dressings and everything, and exercises and everything. He took excellent care of me. And now we're at a stage where I need even more care. <laughs> And he was a fantastic handyman. I've even had to hire a handyman. All the things he was into engineering, that's what he did at Boeing. 
with the planes. So he could do lots of things. I've had to hire somebody else to do them. I had to inflate tires. I've never inflated a tire in my life until about two months ago. I had to buy one of those gadgets and inflate the tire because my husband cannot get down and do those things now. He, he also has atrial fibrillation. That came first. So his energy goes, his heart starts racing, and he cannot do things he used to do. And added to the dementia, that makes life difficult for us. Yesterday, he told me, there's one more person you're going to have to hire. <laughs> he always gets upset on wash day. We need somebody else to do the folding of the clothes. <laughs> I fold them. Usually after he goes to sleep, I fold them because I know he'll fuss about me folding. I never used to because he did it because my bending and stuff is not good for my back. But that's how he deals with it. He said, you're going to have to hire somebody else. So our lives have changed in a drastic way. But I believe that God is with us. He had us do something I didn't want to do, but again, Richard had led us into that one. So I know God is working on Richard and with Richard, regardless of what Richard believes. We've got that insurance, that Genworth insurance, ex extended life health insurance that will pay for our care. that will pay for our care when we need it at home or in a hospital, even after Medicare. And we paid, we didn't realize how many thousands of dollars we paid till they raised the premiums and we con he considered dropping it at that point. I wouldn't drop it. He lowered his, I did not. I still kept it, paying a lot of money because we now need it and we will need it soon. And I'm glad we have Medicare and Medicaid and Federal Blue Cross Blue Shield and Genworth long-term care health insurance because our lives are becoming more difficult, but we're able to afford it financially. He took everything, care of everything when it comes to finances. I started taking care of it a few years ago when I noticed some changes and I'm grateful for Schweitzer. I'm still at Schweitzer, despite this affiliation, because of the Schweitzer choir, mainly. Because of the Schweitzer leadership, which take my teasing and don't put me out, which allows me to do a lot of things that I think another church would not put up with. <laughs> and when I came, I had a lady here when I was working in the pantry ask me, she was new to the pantry, and when we were slow one day, she asked me, why do you come to church here? I was used to just, you know, what do you like about Schweitzer? So, but her question made it perfectly clear. She was asking me, why don't I go to a black church? And I explained that when I came to Schweitzer, they didn't tell me that I was black or white or that I should sit here or sit there. They welcomed me. And the people I worried about, the white-haired elderly ladies, because I figured they were born in the time when you didn't let people like me come strolling in here. I figured I'd have the biggest problem with them. What I didn't gamble with was United Methodist women. All of them were United Methodist women, and they knew about black people. <laughs> they knew they should welcome black people. I soon learned that, and they were the first ones to move over and let me sit. So yes. I used to be the only black person <laughs> for a while, myself and Granville Henderson. But it never bothered me what color I was. 
It's only a problem for other people. I told her, like you. <laughs> Miss Lynette, listening to you is a treat. Which question didn't I answer? <laughs> it's not an issue of I answering know. questions. I know. You gave us a fantastic look into your life. I have uh, a lot of questions. We could, we could go on. We, <laughs> Another hour. Man, I told we could. You. And I, and I won't keep you that long. Mm -mm. But just a couple of different places. Mm -hmm. I was really intrigued by your story of your mom deciding that she needed to take you and your siblings mm -hmm. to um, England. To England. And your dad didn't go. What was that? My stepfather went. Okay. She, she, he wasn't supposed to come. <laughs> that was another. I could have told you another whole story oh my about goodness. my mother's life. I've always thought about writing a book about my mother, but I thought I couldn't live with it. She I had a stepfather then, and she'd had two children with him. One child with him. One had died. One is still alive, sure, and she was traveling. She was a year and a half when we were traveling to England. I was 14. My brother was 12, and Sherman was... She just died a couple of years ago. That's why I went back to England for her death. But... So she was taking his daughter, too, and he said, he's not going to England. He's not leaving his country. He's born here. He's staying here. She, he doesn't know why she's going. She kept back in... <laughs> She made all the arrangements, got the passport. I have my, as a child, we had to have passports attached to hers. And she continued with it, and he was going. But he kept telling us. He, he thought if he kept saying he wasn't going, she would stay. He did not know Pearly Lane as my brother now. Brother and I call her bravely. We can call her by her first name now. <laughs> She's gone. She... <laughs> But he did get some, he must have gotten somebody to help him get a passport and stuff because she did not get his. And when we got to the boat, he showed up and she said, I don't know what you're coming here for, you know. I didn't buy any passport for you. <laughs> he said, I got my own. Oh. And he traveled there with us. But halfway through the trip, I told you it was going to be good. He wished he hadn't. He started complaining one day and fussing and stuff, and that was a mistake. She went down, got his stuff out of the cabin, halfway packed it in a suitcase, you know, stuff sticking out, and she threw it overboard. Every bit of clothes he had with it. And I'm by then, I was already Miss Napoli. <laughs> and my mother... Picked it, the suitcase went flying. Everybody standing at the rails looking, talking, what's that? Look, look, look. I thought, please, God, don't let her throw him over. I hoped he wouldn't come and try to stop her. Because she could have picked him up. He was skinny little fella. She would have picked him up and thrown him to I don't know what we would have done. I thought, please, God, let Mr. Sonny stay away from me so she won't throw him too. <laughs> I told you I've led a very interesting life. You have. My mother was quite a woman, and she took such good care of us. She was, the first thing was the religion thing with her. She was big on religion. Mm -hmm. And I got to see some different kind of religion through her. She was always curious about the voodoo stuff. In Trinidad and Tobago, they call it Obia, O-B-A-H. And you, you could hear things going on mm -hmm. up in the hills and stuff at night. And we knew some people who would go. And we knew our mother would never go there. But one night we caught her. We heard them talking to another lady who was telling her about how they swing chicken. <laughs> and she said, take me with you. She didn't know. She took Steve and I with them too. We follow. <laughs> and we went. And it was it was horrible. We ran, we ran home long before she left because they did pick up a live chicken and swing it. And the Obia man had a big cutlass and, and his eyes looked funny. Steve and I always talk about his eyes went red. The, the whole eyeballs were red. We got the heck out of there and went home. My mother was curious about it. 
She did the Catholic thing long before I became Catholic. She used to do the novena. I learned how to do the novena and the rosary because she believed in God, God in any way. She decided she didn't believe in the obey of God. She said, I ain't God. <laughs> but she she was wonderful. She, she sewed. She sewed for a factory when we got to England. She supported us so well. And my stepfather did too. He fixed cars, Rolls Royces, Bentleys, all those things. He couldn't read or write. We wrote letters to his family back home for him and read them to him. He was a wonderful man. Though They had two more children after that girl. They had two children after she threw his clothes overboard? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They made up. <laughs> they made up. And we owned homes. You, you don't, most common people don't own a home in England. Now they do. Yeah. But back then they didn't. And they used to fuss about us. Foreigners, the colon colonials, coming here and buying homes. We, we never rented. The first house was a rental. After that, we bought. But to buy after that, my mother had to get a Jewish lawyer to buy the house we wanted, and then he sold it to us. <laughs> they didn't want us buying. You should write a book about your mom. <laughs> I told you I've always thought about writing a book about mom. She was... And she brought... His sister, my aunt, and her mother up to England as well. After a while, they came up to England. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. I like to kind of close out with a, like, what's a final word of advice that you'd have for the listeners? You've said so many fantastic things along the way. Um, so many pieces of, of just great wisdom, saintly wisdom. So what would you what would you say to somebody? You know, I even think about you like your grandkids. What would you say to them? It's deep and profound, and it's from you. Maybe you know you may not even think it's profound. But it's just yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> they don't look at me like it's it profound. is profound. It's you. I I think you say some of the most profound. The best things. thing that's happening in my life right now. I told you what's negative happening in my yeah. life right now. The wonderful thing that's happening in my life not right now. My son Monty that lives in Wright City. He is serving in that Wesley Chapel in Wright City. He is serving. He's the head usher, he's the this, he's the that. He sings. He's not a good singer. But I always listen every time he's singing. I, I listen. And they want him to because they don't have enough guys who are willing to get up there and do solos and Monty don't care. He's like his mother. I think he knows <laughs> she doesn't sound that like great. But he's doing so much in that church. I asked him. I said, how much? You, you do give a tithe, don't you, Monty? He said, no, Mom. I said, you don't give money to the church? He said, I didn't say I don't give money. He buys the donuts and stuff every Sunday. He supplies this, that, and the other, he told me. And so I said, are you sure they wouldn't rob you? <laughs> give them a tithe. He said, they wouldn't know what to do with it. I thought, well, that's good stewardship. That's my attitude. I guess you figure that out by now. My attitude with stewardship. I always felt I had to pay for the roof over my head when I'm coming and sitting in the church. At least pay for that little space that's covering my head. But I had some trouble with Richard over that. I give too much money to church. Because the church I was going to in St. Louis, they wanted to raise some money for a big deal. And I gave them a big deal because we were earning a big deal. So I contributed to it. He didn't settle down until he found out. And I didn't tell him. Somebody else at the church told him. What we had given the money for, they were making a decision to spend the money for something else. And somebody knew me well enough to come and say, Lynette, <laughs> I thought I'd better let you know so you don't put the pastor in jail. Because I would. <laughs> you don't do that in a church. Pitch Chapel try that. Raise money for one thing. And then the pastor on his own decides to do it for something else without telling the people. We don't do that. I love God. And I believe firmly in the things that I believe 
God likes. You know what I mean? God doesn't like us hurting each other. God doesn't like us cheating each other. You, you know, you know what is something God would do. What is something Jesus would do? Why would you go and do that if you know that's something Jesus would not do? And to me, it's the, the love people. I love people. And I believe God made us all and God loves us all. And that we need to stop it. You see this thing about the immigration and the border and this. I don't think we should have a border. I know. Go tell. Don't tell Trump. I don't believe we should have borders. You know, I, I really believe the world would be a better place. I'm so grateful that Monty is with the church and he does things for the church. And he has his boys, those two big strapping boys. <laughs> they're in that church and they're seeing their daddy take responsibility in that church. Did I tell you what happened to them one day when Monty, he hadn't been coming for a while and he came, he had Jordan then, that's before he got married again and had these two kids, he had a little Jordan with him. And uh, what's her name? She's died now. Anyway, she was the woman that was going with uh, Granville Henderson. And when she saw him, <laughs> saw Monty and Jordan come with me. She goes up to Monty. People can be so silly. She goes to Monty and she said, I'm so glad you come here. We need more black people in this church because my boyfriend is black. <laughs> That's like, okay. <laughs> I, couldn't, I just stood there and looked at her. I said, you didn't say that. It's not how you welcome people to your church. I, Lord help us. And I knew she didn't mean it the way it came out. Monty was livid. He didn't come back here for a long time. I tried to explain it to him and tell him, he, he, look, he just looked at me. And that's why I thought I'd lost him to the church. <laughs> but he went up there to Wright City. We found the church together where the United, and that's the smallest one. They have a bigger. Yeah. I don't think he'd be as involved in the larger church, but he is so happy and doing things with and for the church and grabbing his sons right along with him. That's something I always, they see me, they see me in the morning. Uh, it's up to, since I don't have anything else to do, it's up to 45 minutes in the morning now I pray and I call people by name that I'm praying for. So they got that exact. Not all of them have followed him. Oh, what my granddaughter, she came here to visit a few months ago, and she does her daily devotions. I've always sent all of them up a room and all whatever the young people's thing is. I've had them get in, so I know they've had access. But <laughs> what got me with her is she came out one day with her Bible and says, you know, Grandma, the best book in the Bible, you know what it is? Thought she'd say Psalms or something like that. She said it's Romans. You read Romans, Grandma. <laughs> That's the best book. In the and a Bible study a couple of weeks ago, we were doing. We were finishing Romans, and a couple of people, including Connie, said, "I've read Romans before, but this is the first time I think I fully understand how good Romans is for us." <laughs> And I told them, my granddaughter found that out years ago. <laughs> that that touches my heart. Thank you, Miss Anna. I love oh, you. Oh, thank you. Oh, you do. Well, a big thank you to Lynette Lewis for coming in and sharing her story. Every time I listen to Lynette, every time I'm around her, I'm just amazed at how God puts saints in our midst. And sometimes they come to us with all kinds of, well, interesting flair. Miss Lynette certainly has interesting flair. But she's a saint among us, and we are all the better for listening to her story. I hope that you are inspired, encouraged, and challenged. And then you begin to behold the really cool people that are around you each and every day. The Really Cool People podcast 
It is a production of Schweitzer Church, Springfield, Missouri. Taylor Likes is the executive producer and editor, and I'm your host, Jason Leininger. You can help us by liking, reviewing, and sharing this podcast. Until next time, stay cool.